How diverse is the microbiome? So for example, let's say you and I have the same diet. How diverse will my microbiome be versus yours? That is really interesting because there's other factors that get into play with this. What we do know is, is that the microbiome can be similar in different regions of the world where the diet is very similar and the lifestyle is similar as well. So like if you go to Sardinia Islands and things like that, where people talk about these blue zones and, and whatever, the microbiome appears to be somewhat similar. But due to other lifestyle effects, exercise, sleep, if the diet is the same, we think it's the same, but are you opening a package? Am I actually having whole food? Plays a big difference. And then how that plays out in relation to the epigenetics, meaning what does your microbiome do for you? What does it do for me? You and I are 99% genetically identical. We could be 90% different with our microbiome. And what does that mean? Hmm, say that again. So we are 90% identical as humans. So you and I are 99%, 99% identical in our genome. Okay. People don't realize is that the microbiome, the 100 trillion bacteria, 1,000 species, actually has its own genome. So the genes that they produce are 100-fold more than what you and I are producing. Two people genetically identical as humans completely opposite with our microbiomes. They've been proven that this is where the whole concept of fecal microbial transplants coming in, how the microbiome right now truly is the new frontier. People talk about it, you hear about it, everybody's trying to jump on this bandwagon, but the reality is it really is a new frontier because we have not really figured out how to completely control it. How we long have you been studying the, the microbiome? Mm. So I was doing clinical research for 10 full years. So the history of this started when I was doing pharmaceutical research. And it was at that time that the whole concept of bacteria creating some disease, meaning IBS, could be the root cause of all this. And that led to the development of a drug called Zyfaxin. Which I think is an incredible drug. I'd love to hear your perspective on that eventually. Yeah, the, the, the story behind it is just very interesting because that's how I started going down the path of developing something natural. Basically, when we were doing the research, uh, they were going for FDA approval on irritable bowel with diarrhea. And irritable bowel syndrome, in my world, when I went to medical school and residency, IBS, if you scope somebody and the blood work was normal, it's in their head. I, I, I remember something, it was actually considered a disease of hysteria. Yes, it very, very similar to back in the 80s when if somebody got an ulcer, actually prior to that, if somebody got an ulcer, it was believed that you have too much stress in your life. You're working too hard, you have an ulcer. Then in 82, I believe, discovered that a bacteria was causing it, Helicobacter pylori. That is the same paradigm shift that took place when I was doing research about 12 years ago where Dr. Mark Pimentel had discovered that something very similar was happening. IBS is not just a functional problem. It's not just something in your head. The traditional person would just be prescribed uh, antidepressants, but irritable bowel syndrome is something that it can be caused by bacteria growing where it shouldn't be called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Certainly in the functional world, they adopted this very quickly. I still have many colleagues that treat people with IBS with antidepressants, that's it. Mm. And so while I was talking to him, and I was part of the clinical trials setting this off, he said, unfortunately, we'll never be able to help the bloated, uh, constipated person because what they're doing is the type of bacteria or the kingdom of bacteria called Archaeobacter is producing something, a gas called methane, which is slowing everything down. And then this just leads to a circular problem producing more bacteria, causing more problems. And that's when I figured out, well, we can, if the pharmaceutical industry doesn't have anything for it, meaning modern day antibiotics don't work, let's look at all, you know, natural alternatives. And that's what I did. At that moment, when I was starting to look at this, so this is way before people were really talking about microbiome and manipulating it, the scientists I was talking to, they were already discussing it, especially in Italy and in Spain. And they were saying, well, if you use these certain polyphenols, we know that this is actually what is helping to produce a diverse microbiome, meaning a very healthy microbiome. So it's 15 years ago when we really started talking about the microbiome back then and how to keep it healthy. That's the biggest thing. And we're still at the beginning. So 15 years into research, from your perspective, we're still just scratching the surface of the gut microbiome. 100%. We can... We can test 
and we can find DNA that gives us clues of what type of bacteria make up your microbiome. We don't know if they're active. We know that we can test for the DNA. Are they alive? Are they doing things? We do know that certain people with certain types of bacteria produce more beneficial metabolites. We know that if you have a narrow microbiome, which we're going to use the term dysbiosis for that. So the standard American diet is causing a lot of this. Antibiotics cause a lot of it. But when you have a narrow microbiome, then you lose the ability to produce all these beneficial things. You lose the ability to decrease inflammation. You lose the ability. Equivalent in your book, when you have fat infiltrating the muscle, the muscle itself doesn't have as much ability to produce all those beneficial things. And mm-hmm. so when you have this narrow microbiome, we know that this, the best, way to, the best way to think about it is treat your microbiome well, it will treat you well. Keep your microbiome young, it will keep you young. Mistreat it. And it becomes almost a parasite. It actually starts hurting you. That's very enlightening. I have a few questions for you. Um, For example, are we born with a certain microbiome? And if so, are some of us born with a more advantageous microbiome? And what are the things that we can do? If there's parents listening, what can we do? And maybe it is equal to everybody. The things that you can do, like sleep, train, Um, have polyphenols uh, across the board is similar, what would you say the foundational aspects of microbiome health are? Well, that's a a kind of a two-part question, but that is a great question. We are born and we already start sharing the mother's microbiome. And we now realize that we thought that the placenta was completely impermeable to other things. So but you're talking it does, about before birth. In fetus, in mm-hmm. utero, there is some exchange of developing exposure to the mother's microbiome. Then the birth process itself, C-section versus vaginal, you're going to be exposed to different microbiomes there. Immediately after birth, all the, the inoculations, things like that, that we don't really have. a. You don't even realize that your child's getting these you know, vaccinations or uh, antibiotics and things like that. That being said, a lot of that is out of your control. What is in your control is what we call the golden window. Basically, zero to age three or four is the golden window of helping your child have the best microbiome because then it's set. And if they end up having a really bad microbiome then, then they have to spend years trying to change lifestyle habits, change things so that the microbiome becomes better. So it actually happens really early on as an infant. And that's something to actually think about. We have to make sure of all the normal daily processes. Like uh, as an adult, we always talk about sleep, exercise, eating whole foods and things like that. Similar to a child, making sure that they have the best possible diet that is not disrupting it, making sure that you're limiting the amount of antibiotics. That's probably the biggest thing for children. But the highly processed foods is super huge in this. Mm. And all of this plays into the fact that when you have a healthy microbiome, you probably can tolerate a lot more of the what life throws at you. Yeah, You're getting hit by whatever, pollutants, all these other things, but you could probably tolerate it a lot better mm. when, when you have a healthy microbiome. If you look at a graph of... Obesity in adolescence. I was going to ask you if that and, was my next question. Yeah, and anxiety mm-hmm. and even ADHD. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating because it just clips along very steadily. And then right around 1978, you see this obesity line start climbing. And a little bit further than that, like 1982, you start seeing anxiety and ADHD. And if you look, that really does correlate with our change in diet, meaning our change in what is allowable in the diet, high Mm -hmm. fructose corn syrup, highly processed seed oils, the flipped ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 emulsifiers. And what we're learning is when we start looking at this, including artificial sweeteners, a lot of these things actually disrupt. There's some gut inflammation, like from the emulsifiers and from from some of the inflammatory seed oils, but there's also disruption of the microbiome. 